Bishop Campbell, and parishioners of African Methodist Episcopal Church, Vice President Wilson, members of the Pennsylvania Society, Mr. Douglas, and other honored guests. Ladies, gentlemen, the great problem to be solved by the American people, if I understand it, is this. Whether or not there is strength enough in democracy, virtue enough in our civilization, and power enough in our religion to have mercy and deal justly with four millions of people but lately translated from the old oligarchy of slavery to the new commonwealth of freedom depends on a large measure the future strength, progress, and durability of our nation. The most important question before us colored people is not simply what the Democratic Party may do against us or what the Republican Party may do for us, but what are we going to do for ourselves? What shall we do towards developing our character, adding our quota to the civilization and strength of the country, diversifying our industry and practicing those lordly virtues that conquer success and turn the world's dread laugh into admiring recognition? The white race has yet work to do when making practical the political axiom of equal rights and the Christian idea of human brotherhood. But while I lift mine eyes to the future, I would not ungratefully ignore the past. 100 years ago, Africa was the privileged hunting ground to Europe and America, and the flag of different nations hung a sign of death on the coast of Congo and Guinea. And for years, unbroken silence had hung around the horrors of the African slave trade. Since then, Great Britain and other nations have wiped the bloody traffic from their hands and shaken the gory merchandise from their fingers. And the brand of piracy has been placed upon the African slave trade. Less than 50 years ago, mob violence belched out its wrath against the men who dared to arraign the slaveholder before the bar of conscience and Christendom. Instead of golden showers upon his head, he who garrisoned the front had a halter around his neck. Less than 25 years ago, slavery clasped hands with King Cotton and said, slavery fights, and Cotton conquers for American slavery. Since then, slavery is dead. The colored man has exchanged the fetters on his wrist for the ballot in his hand. Freedom is king, and Cotton a subject. It may not seem to be a gracious thing to mingle complaint in a season of general rejoicing and yet with all the victories and triumphs which freedom and justice have won in this country i do not believe there is another civilized nation under heaven where are, there are half as many people who have been brutally and shamefully murdered with or without impunity as in this republic within the last 10 years and who cares where is the public opinion that has scorched with red-hot indignation the cowardly murderers of Vicksburg and Louisiana? Sheridan lifts up the veil from Southern society and behind it is the smell of blood and our bones scattered at the grave's mouth. Murdered people, a white league with its covenant of death and agreement with hell, and who cares? What city pauses one hour to drop a pitying tear over these mangled corpses or has forged against the perpetrator one thunderbolt of furious protest. What we need today in the onward march of humanity is a public sentiment in favor of common justice and simple mercy. We have a civilization which has produced grand and magnificent results, diffused knowledge, overthrown slavery, made constant conquest over nature, and built up a wonderful material property. But two things are wanting in American civilization, a keener and deeper, broader and tenderer sense of justice, a sense of humanity which shall crystallize into the life of the nation, the sentiment that justice, simple justice, is the right not only of the strong and powerful, but of the weakest and feeblest of all God's children, a deeper and broader humanity which will teach men to look upon their feeble brethren not as vermin to be crushed out or beast of burden to be bridled or bitten, but as children of the living God, of that God whom we may earnestly hope is in perfect love and perfect wisdom, working for the best good of all. As fellow citizens, leaving out all humanitarian views as a mere matter of political economy, it is better to have the colored race a living force 
animated and strengthened by self-reliance and self-respect than a stagnant mass, degraded and self-condemned. Instead of the North relaxing its efforts to diffuse education in the South, it behooves us for our national life to throw into the South all the helpful reconstructing influences we can command. Our work in this country is grandly constructive. Some races have come into this world and overthrown and destroyed. But if it is glory to destroy, it is happiness to save. And oh, what a noble work there is before our nation. Before, where is there a young man who would consent to lead an aimless life when there are such glorious opportunities before him? Before our young men is another battle. Not a battle against flashing swords or clashing steel, but a battle, a moral warfare. A battle against ignorance, poverty, and low social condition. In physical warfare, the keenest swords may be blunted and the loudest batteries hushed. But in the great conflict of moral and spiritual progress, your weapons shall be brighter for their service and better for their use. And fighting truly and nobly for others, you win the victory for yourselves. Give power and significance to your life. And in the great work of upbuilding, there is room for women's work and women's heart. Oh, that our hearts were alive and our vision quickened to see the grandeur of the work that lies before. We need a deep earnestness and a lofty unselfishness to round out our lives. It is the inner life that develops the outer. And if we are in earnest, the precious things lie all around our feet and we need not waste our strength in striving after the dim and unattainable. Women, in your golden youth, mother, binding around your heart all precious ties of life, let no amplitude of fortune or refinement of sensibilities keep you from helping the weaker or less favored. If you have ampler gifts, hold them as larger opportunities with which you can benefit others. Inviting you to this work, I do not promise you fair sailing and unclouded skies. You may meet with coolness where you expect sympathy, disappointment where you feel sure of success, isolation and loneliness instead of heart support and cooperation. But if your lives are built and based upon these divine certitudes, which are the only enduring strength of humanity, then whatever defeat and discomfiture may overshadow your plans and frustrate your schemes, for a life that is in harmony with God and sympathy for man, there is no such word as fail. And in conclusion, permit me to say, let no misfortunes crush you. No hostility of enemies or failure of friends discourage you. Apparent failure may hold in its rough shell the germs of a success that will blossom in time and bear fruit throughout eternity. What seemed to be a failure around the cross of Calvary and in the garden has been the grandest recorded success. Thank you. <laughs>